All right, so today I want to show you some ball python breeding projects that you may want to avoid if you're breeding ball pythons. And those are the projects that can be extremely complicated, breeding certain combinations of genes together. And of course, there's the, the genetic anomalies with a lot of combinations. For example, you don't want to breed spider to spider or champagne to champagne because the super spider and the super champagne are considered lethal combinations. But other than the genetic defects, there's quite a few different projects that I would probably stay away from. Once you go down the road of breeding certain snakes together, sometimes it can be really complicated trying to figure out exactly what you have in the offspring. So I'm going to jump over to the internet and I'm going to show you some of these more complicated projects and what I would probably avoid breeding ball pythons. All right, so I'm gonna jump over here on morphmarket.com and start with the genetic wizard. This is probably one of the most common ones that I've seen a lot of people do, and that is breeding a lot of multi-gene animals together. And it's kind of interesting when you first start out, you breed, you know, you know, like two or three genes animals together, and pretty soon you get to the point where you may have four or five gene animals as your collection progresses. And I've actually seen a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll take like a five gene combo and breed it to another five gene combo. And kind of on the surface level, it sounds like a pretty good idea because you can get a lot of amazing combinations but let me tell you it can be pretty overwhelming as far as trying to figure out the identification of all of your offspring so what I did is I actually came over here to the genetic calculator and I plugged in some of my favorite genes over here on the left I actually plugged in a male which is a fire, pastel, yellow belly, orange dream, pinstripe. Really bright and flashy genes. The fire, the pastel, the yellow belly, and the orange dream are all really bright. And then I added in the pinstripe because it's one of my favorites. And then over on the right, I actually added in a bunch of dark genes. So we take a bunch of light genes and we breed it to a snake with a bunch of dark genes. And the dark genes I chose for this is the blackhead, the black pastel, the GHI, the Phantom, and I just threw in the Bamboo because it's another one of my favorite. And if you actually had these two snakes and you bred them together, you'd actually get 512 different offspring. Pretty crazy. And you can actually see on every line, one out of 512, it would actually have all these genes here up on the top. And then you kind of have the common name for the morph over here on the right. And the problem is, is you're kind of going down the rabbit hole with a lot of these. It kind of sounds good at the beginning, but if you actually scroll down take a look at this if you actually scroll down at all the different combinations that you can actually get with this breeding it just goes on and on and on down further down into the rabbit hole see we're about halfway down right here and you can see one out of 512 you get some of these six gene combinations which can be really challenging as far as trying to figure out exactly what you have I've actually seen some people do this on some YouTube videos they'll breed like two five gene animals together and they'll do some egg Cutting, and they'll cut open all their eggs and they're at the end of the egg cutting video they're scratching their head and they're like I can't identify one single snake out of everything I produce because there's so many genes and we've never really seen anything like it before if you actually scroll all the way down to this list it's pretty amazing how many combinations that you can end up with breeding two five gene animals together it just goes on, and on, and on. as a matter of fact I actually I, I'm pretty sure I broke the genetic calculator over here because I don't think this is actually a complete list if you actually look at the very bottom one out of 512 you'll actually get a bamboo but if you actually think about the pairing one out of 512 you'd actually get each single gene animal so there's a, a total of 10 genes so there should be the the bottom 10 should all be the single gene animals and you only see two down here so it seems like you're not really it's like the genetic calculator can't even handle these kind of calculations I think there's more than 512 as a matter of fact if you come all the way back to the top and look at the top one the top one has nine traits and technically the top one up here should have a total of 10 traits one out of 512 you'll actually hit all the genes so I think there's actually more than 512 this is let me tell you this is a completely different rabbit hole that you may want to avoid you can really produce some really amazing snakes I've seen some people go down this rabbit hole it's 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 pretty interesting but I don't know if I would personally do it myself because it gets so confusing. 
So here's another project that I've actually seen uh, pretty much nobody has ever tried this before. It's kind of interesting. This is an SK Azanthic. And I always, I always thought it would be interesting. What happens if you actually took one version of Azanthic, bred it to another version, and got the double Azanthic, which would be pretty cool. I think it would be a world's first. And no one, as far as I know, has actually tried this project because it would be too confusing. So this is the SK Azanthic, also known as the TSK Azanthic. TSK stands for the snake keeper, just a certain line of Azanthic that originated from this breeder. And essentially what Azanthic does is it removes all the pigmentation and you're left with a black and gray, kind of a silverish color snake. Sometimes you see a little browns in the Azanthic, but other than that, it pretty much strips all the color. So if you actually took an SK Azanthic and you bred it to a VPI Azanthic, so this is another line of Azanthic that is not compatible with the TSK which is kind of interesting and they look they look almost exactly the same and there's certain variabilities in the the different lines of azanthic sometimes they can be kind of a like a metallic kind of a, a silvery color like this and I've actually seen some that are a little bit brown and I would say probably the only way this would really work is if you could actually see the differences in the lines before you bred them together or if you actually produced a visual you could figure out which one it was otherwise it'd be, <laughs> there's a lot of overlap in a lot of these azanthics so if you actually take the TSK Azanthic and you bred it to the VPI Azanthic, essentially this is what you'd get. You'd get all normal looking snakes that would be double het for both lines of Azanthics. And this one happens to be just a het VPI Azanthic. I actually looked over here and there wasn't one single snake that was double het for two lines of Azanthic. No one has ever tried to do this project. And it'd be kind of interesting because if you actually took two of the double hats and bred them together, you potentially, I think it's one out of eight chance you'd actually get a double visual it would be a visual vpi tsk azanthic which who knows what that looks like a lot of times you think you know that would probably just look like a regular azanthic because it you know pretty much has two different lines of azanthic in the same snake but who knows it could you know it could be like a blue or snake or like a purple snake or something like that no one's ever produced it so no one really knows exactly what it would look like with two different lines of the Azanthic, but probably what I would do is I would just avoid breeding the VPI Azanthic to a TSK Azanthic, unless you want to go down this rabbit hole. If you actually produced this and you bred them together and you got Azanthic looking snakes, you wouldn't know if it was the VPI visual or the TSK visual, or if you actually hit the double visual where you had all four copies of the different lines of Azanthics in the same snake. So it can get really confusing, but it would be kind of interesting to see if you could actually produce Produce a double visual as far as you know two different lines of azanthics in the same snake would be pretty awesome so here's another project I would probably avoid if I was into some of these projects. This is actually an Ultramel. Ultramel is not really that popular. I've seen them at the reptile shows. Really amazing. It's actually a recessive gene. So you need two copies of the gene for a visual. And there's a gene that looks really close to the Ultramel, and that is the Monarch. And take a look at this. This is the Monarch. If you actually look at the Monarch compared to the Ultramel, some of them look almost exactly the same. It's pretty amazing. Although in a lot of the, the monarchs it seems like a lot of the monarchs actually kind of have a little bit darker of a background seems like it darkens a little bit as they age and mature I've actually seen some people kind of go down the line of you know having two similar genes that are recessive breeding them together and if they actually produce a visual they can pick out little differences between them but I would say between the monarch and the ultramel it's really close and the kind of the bummer about this is there's such a huge price difference between the ultramel and the monarch the Ultramel is like 10 times the money less than a lot of your monarchs. Pretty crazy. If you actually breed them together, it, you know, at first when I got into ball pythons, I was wondering, hey, I wonder what happens if you breed an Ultramel to a monarch. I wonder if it's the same gene or not, or I wonder if they're compatible. And come to find out, I actually found someone in a reptile form somewhere, actually took an Ultramel, bred it to a monarch, and they got the double hats, head for Ultramel and head for monarch. And I couldn't find one over here. I'm more like not really that popular breeding an Ultramel to a monarch. I don't know, other than that one person that said they did it, I don't know if anyone would actually go down this road. Because if you actually produced the double heads and you bred them together, you'd have a hard time figuring out if you
you had Monarchs or Ultramels, or if you could produce the double visual, that would be pretty amazing and get a Monarch Ultramel, and who knows what that would look like. It would be kind of an interesting project, but on the flip side, it would be extremely confusing. All right, so here's another project that I would probably avoid, and that is two recessive genes that look really similar, the lavender albino and the candy. And kind of the interesting thing with the lavender albino is as a hatchling, it looks almost like a regular albino with a really bright white background. And as it ages and matures, it actually turns into more of a lavender color. And it looks really similar to the candy. This is what the candy looks like. And I haven't seen anyone actually take a candy, breed it to a lavender albino, so it's kind of interesting I haven't actually seen double hats over here or like a candy het lavender or a lavender head candy and I always you know sometimes you know in the back of my mind I'm thinking I wonder if these are actually compatible if you took a candy and bred it to a lavender albino if you'd get something like you know the toffinos or the candinos with one copy of each gene where you'd get a visual It'd be kind of interesting I haven't actually heard of anyone trying to take a candy and breed it to a lavender albino although on this project I think you may May be able to tell the difference between the candy and the lavender albino as a hatchling. I'm thinking the lavender albino might be a little bit brighter white and the candy might actually develop the color a little bit faster than the lavender albino. So it may be a project worth pursuing. It'd be kind of interesting to actually produce a candy lavender albino visual in the same snake which would be kind of crazy. So here's another project I've actually seen some people go after here on Morph Market, and that is the butter and the lesser. And when it comes to the butters and the lessers, some people think they're exactly the same gene, although I've seen a lot of butters that are a lot brighter than lessers, and some of the lessers are a lot darker than the butters. As a matter of fact, when I first saw this snake right here, I thought for sure this was a lesser, and come to find out it was actually a butter. This looks pretty much exactly like a really bright lesser. So this this is the butter and here is the lesser. The lesser and the butter are both in the blue-eyed leucistic complex. So if you actually took a lesser and bred it to a butter, what you'd end up with is an all-white snake with blue eyes. And the problem is if you actually took that all-white snake with blue eyes and bred it to something else, half the offspring would come out as lesser, half would come out as butters. And unless you started with really different versions of the butter and the lesser, I'd say a lot of times it could be almost impossible to kind of figure out what you have a lesser versus a butter and I've actually seen a lot of people do that mix and as a matter of fact over here at Morph Market I've actually seen some lesser slash butter blue-eyed leucistics which can get a little bit confusing because everything you produce from that you pretty much have to label it as a lesser slash butter you don't know one line from the other that's pretty confusing and some people are like all right I want to keep my lessers separate from the butters and I don't want to mix them together so here's another project, this is kind of interesting, the sulfurs versus the fires. A lot of people think that the sulfur is a different line of the fire, but I found pretty much there, there is some overlap between the sulfurs and the fires, but if you look at the supers, you can definitely tell a difference, and it seems like some of the super sulfurs have a lot more orange coming down the back. So essentially what this is, this is a black-eyed leucistic, where you get an all-white snake with black eyes. Sometimes you'll get all white super sulfurs and all white super fires but I'd say in, in more of the cases with the, the super sulfur you actually get a lot of the orange spots coming down and with the super fire you get less of the orange if you actually take a look at a super fire I'd say this is pretty much typical of a super fire where you just get a little bit of color right down the top of the back and I've actually seen some people taking a fire breeding it to a sulfur and getting the sulfur fires the all white snake and the that has one copy of each gene which gets a little bit confusing so if you actually took that and you bred it to something else this is what you'd get you'd get either a fire or a sulfur and this is essentially what a fire looks like and I've actually seen some fires that are a little bit more kind of a tan color I'd say this is probably one of the brighter fires that I've seen most of them have uh, kind of a like a faded out head on the top you can definitely tell the difference between a fire and a normal and a fire is usually considered to be 
a lightening jeans. So if you mix it in with other jeans or other combinations, it can really lighten the background. It can really brighten some of your bright and flashy snakes. But the problem is, is I found pretty much across the board between the fire and the sulfur, if you work it into other combinations, they work almost exactly the same. For example, you can actually take the fire and work it into vanilla to make the vanilla creams. And you can do the same exact thing with the sulfur and make the sulfur creams, which is kind of cool. And really the only way to tell the difference between the fire and the sulfur is to make the supers and look at the amount of yellow in the supers. I'd say it would get really confusing if you actually started with a fire slash sulfur and started breeding it through your collection. So here's another project that can get really confusing. I would probably avoid this one, and that is breeding the desert ghosts to the desert, which probably nobody has ever done that I have ever seen. And when it comes to the desert and the desert ghost, the desert ghost is a really awesome gene. It's, it's a recessive gene. You need two copies of the gene for a visual, and when you work other genes into the desert ghost, you can make some really impressive combinations. And kind of the weird thing about the desert ghost is it looks really similar to the desert Desert. This is what the desert looks like and I'd say they almost look exactly the same as a standalone gene Some of them are kind of a bright yellow like this and there's kind of azanthic versions of both the desert ghost and the desert Which is kind of interesting they almost look exactly the same as a standalone gene And when you work it in with other combinations and kind of the interesting thing about the desert is it's a co-dominant gene So you can actually work the desert into other combinations and you don't need two copies of the gene you just need one copy and it looks exactly like a desert ghost combination but it's really easy to produce and the, the only bummer with the desert is that there's a problem with the females where the females should not be bred a lot of people say that the females will lay infertile eggs or a lot of times the females will actually die if you try to breed them so there's not many people actually working with the desert but if you're working with the desert I'd probably not breed it with the desert ghost and get the two confused although it'd be kind of interesting if you can actually produce a desert desert ghost visual with uh, with both genes that it would actually be three genes you'd have two copies of the desert ghost and one copy of the desert in the same snake that would be kind of interesting so there's two more i wanted to show you here at the end and that is this one right here this is a banana slash coral glow which gets really confusing uh, a lot of people think that the bananas and the coral glows are exactly the same and i'm convinced it's exactly the same gene and kind of the, the the more confusing part is is if you actually come over here to morph market you'll actually see them listed as banana slash coral glow but a lot of times you'll read the description and you'll say this is a nice young coral glow hatchling and a lot of people will throw in the banana just because you have the search ability over here on morph market a lot of people are searching for bananas and then they'll pull up the banana slash coral glow come to find out it's actually a coral glow instead of a banana but a lot of people have I've actually take a, taken a banana and bred it to a coral glow and you will get the super the banana coral glow so it's actually uh, if, if you produce the super banana or the super coral glow looks pretty much the same a little bit faded out with two copies of the gene and the problem is is if you actually produced a super with the banana and the coral glow and you bred it to something else half the offspring would be banana half would be coral glow and you wouldn't be able to tell one from the other and pretty much from that point on you'd have to listen all your offspring as a banana slash coral glow. So here's the last one I wanted to show you. This one is, I'd say, maybe even similar to the banana slash cargo, where a lot of people think it's the same exact gene, and that is the toffee and the candy. Kind of interesting. Looks almost like a coral glow, which is kind of interesting. As a hatchling, they look really similar. But the coral glow is actually a co-dominant, and the toffees and candies are actually a recessive gene. And these don't get the spots that you'd see in the coral glows and bananas as it ages and matures. But a lot of people, when, when they talk about toffee and candy a lot of times they'll they'll actually put both genes in the combination which can get even more confusing because a lot of times they'll come over here and say hey I bought a, a toffee and a candy thinking it has both genes but in reality it actually has either one or the other this is either a candy or a toffee and a lot of people don't even distinguish the two which is kind of amazing so you can actually take a toffee breed it to a candy and you'd get a snake that is I guess it technically it would be 
be hat for toffee and hat for candy and you'd still get the same visual effect because it's a recessive gene. If you actually bred it to something else, you'd get like half uh, toffees and half candies depending on what you bred it to. So I'd say in some cases, some people kind of kind of blur the lines between the two genes, but these are some of the genes that can get really confusing and some of the projects that I would probably avoid when breeding ball pythons. All right, so it is time for the question of the day. And Mr. Danny Lane asks, have you ever thought about breeding your coral glow to your banana to see if they're compatible and check for differences? And that is a very good question. So I actually do have bananas and coral glows in my collection. And I have thought about breeding the two lines together. The problem is both my coral glow and my banana are both males and they're male makers. So every single banana and coral glow offspring that I produce from those two snakes are all males. And in order to breed one to another, you obviously you need a male and a female and someday if I ever actually ever produce a female banana or coral glow I may actually cross those two lines together and see what the super looks like with one copy of the banana and one copy of the coral glow. So that is pretty much it. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.